EMS services. So we're called to order. Can we stand or, or however you're comfortable for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, we'll do roll call now. Just a reminder to all board members to unmute yourself before roll calls. So, Mary, can you do a roll call? Yes, for um, Salisa Valley Fire and Rescue, Director Hickson. Here. Director Green. Director Burns. Here. Director Polisi. Here. Director Spade. Here. For Western Line Ambulance, Director Webb. Here. Direct, Director Webb. Here. Director Russell. Here. Director Farnsworth. Here. Director Yesney. That was Director. Okay. Director Yesney. Here. Director Murphy. Here. Sure. Wolfia, Director Farnsworth. Here. Director Green, Director Yesney. Here. And Director Hicks. Okay. Here. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mary. Uh, for the agenda, we'd like to offer two amendments to the agenda. We'd like to include uh, approval of the purchase of a vehicle for the MIH program. That will be for Western Lane Ambulance District. That will be under new business. And then we'd also like to add an executive session tonight for after the, the conclusion of the regular meeting for um, discussions with the labor negotiators. So when you're making your motions to approve the agenda, if you could include those amendments. So, uh, SCFR. Need a motion and a okay. second. Uh, it was second? Police second. Okay. Who, who made the motion? Ed did. Yeah. Ed Hickson. Yeah, made a motion to approve the agenda, and including the two. Um, Agenda, um, yeah, amendments that were added at the end. Okay. I'm sorry, I think my connection's bad. I keep going in and out. I think everyone. <coughs> yeah. Yes. So you want to do a roll call vote, Mary? Okay. So. Yes. Director Hickson. Sorry, let's do a roll call vote to approve the agenda. Go ahead, Mary. Director Hickson. Yes. Director Green. Director Burns. Yes. Director Polisi. Yes. Director Spade. Yes. Uh, sorry, I think everybody's having bad connections tonight. Yes. We'll, we'll try and get through this. So for Western Lane, uh, this is Rick. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the two amendments. I'll second that. This is Mike. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. Mary, can you do a roll call vote? I didn't get. I didn't get who second. And Mike. Mike. Okay. Mr. Director Webb. Director Webb. Yes. Director Russell. Yes. Director Farnsworth. Yes. Director Yesney. Yes. 
Director Murphy. Yes. I'll make a motion on behalf of Wafia to amend the agenda with the two amendments. That was Director Parker. Okay. Second Ned. by Rick. Well, I think it was Ned. That was Ned. Was Ned. Ned. Uh, second by Ned. Dixon. Director Farnsworth. Yes. Director Green. Director Yesney. Yes. Director Hickson. Yes. Okay, that's the approval of the agendas by all three boards with the, the two amendments. Adina, do we have anybody signed up for public comments? No, we do not. Okay. Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, we need to have approval of the minutes. Uh, SVFR. Uh, yeah, before we to just take, since we're talking about the minutes, I just want to take a moment to remind all the directors that we need to follow the same forum and professionalism in these Zoom online meetings that we would in in-person meetings. And look, looking back over a uh, video from the recordings from some of the previous meetings, um, that's not always been the case. And I don't know if you just, folks don't realize that they're actually being recorded or whether they're on the screen or not, or if they're not muted. Uh, but those comments in the breath, or if they're sounds, they are going into the minutes. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. And uh, we need to conduct ourselves the same way we would in an in-person meeting, uh, public meeting, if we were having it at the fire station. So just a reminder to everybody. Uh, with that, can I get a motion to approve the minutes for SVFR? So uh, Ned, 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 this is Director Spade. Ned, Director Spade here, can I, can I make a comment? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, in and out. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, Director Spade, uh, I think that, that we should remove the editor of comments by uh, the record. So you, you're asking that we, you're suggesting that we should remove the comments from the minutes? The editorial comments in the minutes, yes. Okay. Um, Is that a motion, well, Sam? Well, if we can have more discussion on that. Are you, are you referring to uh, comments that were not specifically said in well, response to it. It was a public record here, and I don't think it was uh, appropriate that those comments would be uh, in the public record. You know what I'm referring well, to? Well, in public record because these meetings are recorded and made available to the public. So this is just a transcription of what anyone would okay. see or if they were watching these already. It was comments about a raspberry from a director. I don't think right. that's appropriate. Well, I don't think the, you know, I don't think those were appropriate to begin with. If we were sitting in a public meeting and someone blew a raspberry or made a sound, it would, would be heard and seen by everybody who was at the public meetings. So we're not revealing anything that anyone wouldn't see as if it had happened in an actual meeting, which these are actual meetings. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important if you're, to make those kinds of comments or noises or whatever just make sure you got your mute on unless you're responding to a direct question otherwise they're going to end up in there because if this was a public meeting and we we're all together it would be it would be heard and it'd be re and they're already recorded any other comment i mean how does everybody else feel about that if if somebody had if somebody did something and i've said things off the cuff, it is what it is. And, and it's whether it's public, you know, or Zoom meeting, if we did it at the fire station, it would be televised or it would be recorded on television. It, it just what it is. And we all have to live with what, what we say or not. I Sometimes I say something that's a little off the cuff that lets some steam off, but 
you know, I live by what I say and say what I do and do what I say. So, I mean, that's why I and Ed's this absolutely right by saying just we need to, even though we're you know, sitting in our houses or our offices and we're doing these things, these are still public meetings that are being recorded and made available to the general public. And we need to remember that uh, even though we're in a different venue right now. But I understand what you're saying, Sam. That's the only comment I have about it. All right, thank you, Sam. Any other comments? Okay, if not, then uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes for SVFR for 528? So moved. Director Byrne. Okay, second. We need a second. Do we have Mr. that on that? By Spade. S Spade seconds it. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. All right, uh, minutes are approved. We have to we have to vote. Okay. Mary, can, okay, can you do I, a roll call vote? I get a uh, Director Hickson. Yes, please. Director Green. Director Burns. Yes. Director Polisi. Yes. Director Spade. Yes. Thank you. So for Western Lane. I move that we approve the minutes. I will second that. Director Webb? Yes. Director Russell? Yes. Director Farnsworth? Yes. Director Yesney? Yes. And Director Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Wolfia? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Oh, Ned, you seconded, okay. Director Farnsworth? Yes. Director Green? Director Yesney? Yes. And Director Hickson? Yes. Okay, all minutes have been approved. Uh, Dana, do you want to do the monthly financial review? Yes. So we are 11 months into the fiscal year, so expenses should be tracking at or below 92%. For Sayusa Valley Fire, I am pleased to announce that we have received a reimbursement request from FEMA for the SAFER grant in the amount of $102,009. Glad to have that one done. Um, so I will be submitting another uh, reimbursement request. It won't be as much, but um, I will be reimbursed, uh, submitting that soon. For Western Lane Ambulance, we also received uh, $250,000 for the Mobile Integrated Healthcare uh, program. So this is for a two-year contract that starts June 1, 2020 and terminates May 31st, 2022. You will note that we've made a couple of adjustments on the, uh, the balance sheet for Western Lane. We have added this $250,000 uh, under other current liabilities it's account number 2050. And as we move forward, we will be doing monthly journal entries to move money. It's about 10,000 and change over into the, um, the profit and loss uh, on a monthly basis as we begin to spend that money. And as of the date, June 22nd, when I put out this report, we had processed 1,345 life med renewals, totaling 87,425, but that we have way surpassed that. I think we're up to at least 16, if not 1,700 applications. And I really wanna give a shout out to my administrative staff because they have rocked on this and they have done a great job 
and as well as kept up with all of the rest of their responsibilities. They've just done an amazing job and I'm real proud of them. Also, the last month there were some uh, questions of concern from Western Lane Board Directors on some of the entries on the balance sheet from the journal, uh, the, the journal entries that I had done from the auditor. Those have been corrected. And I also, just to, just to make a note, there was an error discovered in the Western Lane um, PERS for um, that line item, uh, account number 5123. It was in the month of March. We had a payroll issue in the month of March that we had to make some corrections on. Everything straightened out, but there had been a previous amount that was in error and that has been corrected. With that, I open it up for questions. Tina, have you had a chance to set up the PERS side account? No, I was going to do that after July 1st. Okay. That'll be for this year, right? Yes. Okay. Well, great. for what do you, you mean this year? For, for the year ending June 30th? Um, so that, was, that would be for the 150? Correct. Okay, I will do that next week. Okay, great. Dina, along those lines, um, I think we had also passed a resolution for, it wasn't much money, but when we sold the part of the sidewalk for the crosswalk, I think there was a motion to move that money also into the PERS side account. Yes, and we have received that check. It was for $8,400, and Director Webb had made that motion, and we will certainly do that. Okay, thank you. So is it your intent to have that done before the end of the year then for us? Yes, I'll do that on Monday. Great, thank you. Um, Dina, I have a couple of questions. Are you gonna include Will Fia in this as well? Um, as far as what? Just reviewing the financials. Well, I don't have anything to really point out, uh, I, uh, so I'm available for questions if you have any. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Um, page 39, just a question on a transaction for Western Lane on um, May 19th, Val Valley Motor Corp for $2,100. Is that a, do you know what that was for? Or maybe Matt knows. Matt would know that was on his card. So uh, that was a transaction in on the MasterCard statement for Valley Motor Company. Mm -hmm. Let Matt answer that. I it was like a 2200 Sorry, Matt. Yeah. No, it's okay. Matt, do you Valley, know that offhand, or do you want me to look it up? I'm trying to get to it. What was the price of it? It was about $2,200. Well, Valley is where we take Medic 9, and I believe it was the Medic 9 issue that occurred that we had to get a valve replaced. We had a sensor alarm go off on it and had to, so Valley, I'm almost certain that's the charge off the top of my head. It was for maintenance on Medic 9. Okay. Um, and then I was wondering on page 42, <clears throat> I was, I'll let you get there if you need a second. I'm there. Um, this is uh, Wolfia, I believe. The, the uh, MCR program shows grant revenue of about 74,000, but how do you get the expenses that go with that grant? Because I, I see MCR program down in 87,100 for 34,000. Is it, is it payroll up above? Is that? So there you've got a line item, um, the MCR program line 5320. That is the wages for the MCR um, okay. staff. Then you've got the um, the materials and services of the 33,860 
And then the difference is the administrative fees that we, Super. there's uh, $25,000 annual that we get to administer the program, which is not on this report. Great. So we're paid ahead, but that's actually our administrative fee that we're paid more than the expenses. Right. Okay. And the other question I had was just in Wolfia again, it looks like we transferred for on the monthly statements, which is I think the next page. Uh, we transferred quite a bit in um, 150,000 and our year to date, we have a net income of about 100,000. Are we, are we done for the year as far as transfers into Wolfia from SVFR and Western Lane? Yes, yes we are. And that okay. uh, tides us over to uh, pay for the June payroll, which will hit on uh, July, let's see, the payday is July 3rd. So we won't, we won't have any transfer expense out of SBFR or Western Lane in June? Correct. Okay. So when this, this 111,000 net income is it our thought that this number is going to zero out at the end of June? So where are you? I'm on page 42 and a half, so to speak, 43. Um, I think my question is the same as Rick's. So we show net income of 111,000 in Wafia, and Wafia should just be a break even operation, right? Well, what do you mean? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, so right now on the bottom line, it shows net income of 111,473. <laughs> so what Rick was asking is, if you've transferred the, the, the funds from SVFR and Western Lane to cover your payroll in June, and since this report ended in May, what we're assuming is that you're going to use 111,000 and pretty much break even because well that would be the intent yes absolutely but since this is our first year uh implementing this program um it may not hit zero exactly uh mm -hmm. we still have all of june the june expenses to be posted to to this mm -hmm. financial report so that will be a, a really good conversation to have next month when we have that report in front of us Okay, so that's that's the question I had. So basically, uh, going forward, Wafia in and of itself, you wouldn't want to get the impression from looking at this that Wafia was making a profit off the other two agencies. The revenue stream is supposed to equal the expenses throughout the year. Correct. Okay. Well, uh, other other than what we're receiving for the MCR grant, so that would. We right. have to know that that's income, but yeah, it's not from the agencies. Right, but we think there's a, that's a, there's a very small amount that's left over, right? For the administrative expense, isn't that what it's we do? It's 25,000 a year, so yeah. There we go, gotcha. Yeah, and Larry, it looks like on page 44, the expenses for May were 83,000, so if we have 111 in there and we don't transfer, it's, it's gonna be down to 20,000 20, range. Right, and that's that's what we would expect. You wouldn't want to, yep. run, wouldn't want right. to good run, yep. but, yeah. Yeah, good point. <clears throat> that's all I had. Any other questions? Just one. Have we concluded? Um, it seems like there's varying different, various different opinions about showing our PERS liability on our balance sheet. I think you asked the auditor that when he was doing the presentation and he said that that would not be uh, on, on this with our modified accrual. That is not what we would have on this balance sheet. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly. Okay. I'm confused about that. I admit it. What do, what do you think, Rick? Um, I, I think you leave it off <clears throat> and I could, go through that with you sometime because a, a budgetary method focuses on current expenses and current income. Um, and they usually leave off long-term liabilities and long-term assets. We, we do record 
equipment, but we set aside and fund balance and an equal amount so that we don't we don't count that as fund balance carried forward that can be spent. Other than that, uh, we're on what's called the modified accrual basis for budget, and that that would fit the modified accrual basis of budget not to have long-term liabilities or assets on there. Well, the reason I asked that is I was reading the letter at the end of our board package, and it said, yes, it is considered debt owed to current and former employees for past services rendered. Uh, however, this debt payment is factored into the rates the district contributes to PERS pay based on payroll. It wasn't until recent years that the GASB changed the lines to require a debt service line to show pension obligation and pension budgets and public budgets despite the obligation to pay already set into the PERS rates. So yeah, uh, I, I have no idea what that is. I think there's conflicting guidance. So I think that's what we need to research. Yeah. And remember Gasby, well, anyway, generally accepted accounting principles includes two bases of accounting. So modified accrual and full accrual. Right. So, the, so I, I saw that too and I was perplexed. I, I don't know what he's getting at with that, frankly. Okay. Rick, this is John. Hi, John. Um, aren't we showing our money market account on there, and wouldn't that be considered a long-term asset? Yeah, it's cash. Well, cash is always considered a current asset because it's available to spend within a year if you needed to. So by definition, cash and usually accounts receivable are considered current assets and your accounts payable and payroll payable is considered current liabilities. Thank you. I see what you're saying. Any more questions? There is no old business. So we'll move on to new business. First action item was concerning the Welfia board members. I've heard there's some discussion about, well, we, we put that on there to elect new board members is what's indicated in our current agreement for Welfia. Um, but I think there's some discussion about if we want to do it tonight or later on in the year. Well, yeah, I kind of raised a thought on that, that if you want the board presidents, um, if you want to consider having each board president on the Wilfia board, we won't elect officers until next month. And I'm, I'm, I've got my two years up that I agreed to do, and I'm going to be looking probably for somebody um, else to step into that president role. So I don't know if, if, if the board feels like they want to consider, I don't think it's required, we could move ahead and elect officers, but if you want to consider having your board president on Wilfia, we would kind of have to wait to do it until after people are elected next month. Seems like a practical thing to do. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So we will have to amend the agreement to do that. The agreement now says that uh, board members will be elected or their term starts July 1. Um, and I, I believe it, it doesn't need to be a resolution, but we'll need an amendment to change the date, the, the term of the board members. So are you saying we'll make well, that motion? And um... No, that would have to be each board would have to do that. Okay. Change that agreement? We don't have to do that. I, I just thought maybe if you wanted to consider having that as an option, you'd want to wait. It's easy to do. Ned? Both boards would have to amend it. Okay. Ned? Yeah. I, I would highly suggest don't change the agreement if the agreement said by July 1, do it by July 1. Don't change in midstream something that is going out there in the public. Well, I think it's a matter of when we 
made that plan originally, we had not really anticipated the change happening before the um, the presidents and the vice presidents and the boards. I think it makes sense, you know, to make the change now, and then we don't have to worry about it moving forward. And it will all it makes sense to to appoint the presidents and the vice presidents and who the board positions are before we decide who's going to be appointed to the Wealthia board. Then when I get, I mean, Rick certainly has a good point and I do, but why was the agreement written up the way it was? I think that was, well, Chief, I don't know if you have a comment on that. I, I think it was standard language. We just overlooked the process. I don't think the intent was to have the, the board president as a standing member. I mean, it's fine, but I don't think that was the intent at the time the agreement was made. That's true. I, I don't believe the board president or vice president should be on the WAFIA board. Looks like a direct conflict of interest to me. Well, I can see that. Um, I think originally when we set up the, the WELFIA board, we, we went with the presidents because they had been the ones who were most involved in the change. But I, I think that um, John's point has some merit uh, in terms of having some other eyes and some other objectivity on the WELFIA board, who's not a, mem a president. I just, the idea to me, Ned, if I may share or repeat, I don't believe in changing the rules once the rules have been set. Mm -hmm. Now it may be the president, it may not be the president, but the rules and the pattern has been set to do it by July 1. Don't change the rules because somebody then can say, well, they changed the rules just to sub support what they want to get done. I certainly well, don't have a problem with it. Chief, if I remember correctly, there's nothing in there that's that Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything in there, Chief, that says specific, specifically the WOFIA board has to be made up of presidents of each it board. Not. It just yeah. says two board members from each board yeah. for one-year terms. We did discuss having staggered terms, um, but that was not uh, an approved motion. Well, if that's the case, um, I don't have a problem with appointing the WELFIA board tonight. And um, I guess we just run the risk of uh, somebody being appointed to WELFIA. Well, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're appointed to WELFIA, Western Land Ambulance, or SVFR, and then you're not, you're still a member of the WELFIA board. Right. Correct. And it doesn't matter whether you're president or not, you're no second class board member. Yeah, that's correct. Does that make Rick to you? Yeah, it's fine. I just wanted to bring it up as a point. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. But you know, if ultimately it doesn't really matter whether you're president now or not, because once you're on the Wealthia board, you're on the Wealthia board, even if you stay on as president of the other board or you're not. So it sounds like the consensus is to go ahead and elect uh, new or elect Wealthia board members that would take office July 1, two from each agency. Okay. Ned, that would be my, follow the rules. Yeah, no, I think that I think we're, the consensus is let's go ahead and appoint uh, the wealthy board members tonight. And if, if you're president now, not president on July 1st, that's okay. That sounds that's good. Okay, Western Lane Ambulance District. Would you like to? I think these will handle these as elections versus appointments by the board president. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's open for nominations for Wealthia Board representation. Western Lane Ambulance District. I move for John Murphy to be a member. I'll second. 
I move to nominate Cindy Russell. <laughs> I'll second. So we have uh, two names put forward, John Murphy and Cindy Russell for uh, representation on the Wealthia board. Um, do we wanna take them individually? Yeah, we should probably do a roll call. So for John Murphy as Wolfia or Western Lane representative on the Wolfia well, board. I'm sorry, we could probably do them both together, just a roll call vote. Okay, so for Cindy Russell and John Murphy as the Western Lane Ambulance District representatives on the Wolfia board. Mary, can you do a roll call vote? Yes, Director Webb. Yes. Director Russell. Yes. Director Farnsworth. Yes. Director Yesney. Yes. And Director Murphy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so your term of office will begin July 1 and it'll go through June 30th. Okay, SVFR. I would like to nominate Jim Polisti to the Wealthia Board. Is there a second? I yes. Second that. Okay. Who's that? Sam Spade. Spade. For the second position. Sam Spade. Is there a second? And that? Second. Ned, Ned, okay, Ned Hickson seconded that. Okay. Hey, folks, I'm having a real hard time hearing. There's like about a 15 second delay coming through on me, and my video keeps cutting out. Yeah, that's, and then you get elected when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, well. Okay, so. It's, it's uh, Jim Polisi and Sam Spade have been um, nominated for uh, SVFR representation to the uh, Wealthia Board. Uh, Mary, can you do a roll call of SVFR? Yes. Director Hickson. Yes. Director Burns. Yes. Director Polisi. <laughs> no comment. Yes. <laughs> and Director Spade. Yes. Well, thank you guys. Congratulations. Again, that begins July 1 and goes through June 30th. So the next uh, uh, new business, number five, that's the current Wealthia board. So sorry, uh, new board members, you don't get to, to weigh in yet. So just, uh, I've been, I was talking, I'm disappointed that uh, Director Green's not here, but I've been talking to him. We just wanted to be really transparent with what we wanted to do with Wealthia uh, wages and benefits. Uh, uh, Dana, was that included in the board packet? Was what included? The changes that we had proposed for, well, it was in the budget, but so it was, if you remember from the budget that we proposed, um, I'm just thinking without Director Green here, it makes it very difficult. Would it be appropriate to defer that agenda item till July or, or do you want it in place so we can start July 1? It would start July 1, but um, again, it was just to reinforce what, what had been approved by the boards. So right. there wasn't any necessary action. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the board was, we were completely transparent. Uh, but we can certainly bring it back up again in, in July. Well, we okay, going on to number six, strategic business plan meeting updates. And starting on page um, 48, so I reached out to ESCI, Emergency Services Consulting International. Um, some of you may remember they um, ran the uh, strategic planning process for uh, the ambulance district and the fire department the last time. Um, so I reached out to them and I also reached out to ELCOG, Lane Council of Government. They also will uh, facilitate strategic planning. Um, so the information that you see in your board packet is from ESCI. Uh, it gives their the scope of work that they will do. It also gives a price sheet 
Um, I only included the one price sheet that has strategic planning. They do everything. They'll do master planning. They'll do merger studies. They'll do uh, executive hiring for you. They, they do quite a bit. But um, So I just included the one um, strategic plan pricing, and that's at 16350 My intent would be that that would be include both agencies. I still have to confirm that with them, that they wouldn't be doing this separately. Um, again, if the wards wanted the strategic planning process to be separate, it would probably be then 16000 apiece. Um, but I'm hoping that we could facilitate this as a joint uh, strategic plan and that it would be, um, we could just, it'd be 16350 split by both groups. Um, LCOG has been a little bit reluctant to give us any information. Um, the gentleman that runs it um, was on vacation for a week and asked him for information when he got back. Um, they want to do it with us. He just has not given us any information. Um, he knows that we need that information. He knows that I wanted it for tonight. Um, but if the desire of the board is just to move forward with the SCI or to wait for uh, LCOG to give us a price, um, I'm, I'm okay either way. The SCI certainly does good work. I have no idea what the LCOG work looks like. Comments? So, so Chief, this, and this, this is Rick. I'm, I'm I mean, we're familiar with. Um, I'm sorry, by page 55, where it talks about the pricing. So is yep. the proposal that they put in here is all covered under figure number two? Yes. Strategic so Plan what, Citizen Forum. Sorry? Yes, and that would be, I, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what they did before. Before being with the, the last strategic plan that was about five years ago. Okay, that's with the this yeah, and so the process they've described is figure number two. What what the heck? Why are three and four so high, and what are those, and what do they add? Why why are those in there? They're, they're included just because they're on the same page. Um, we're not asking for them to do that. Okay. I was, figure three would be just that's like a merger study. Okay, I was like, yeah, Sorry. I was choking a little bit on figure three and four. Oh yes, they have some high prices on things. Yeah, and they would be more than happy to talk to the board if we would like that. Well, so so timing, I think. Because I always think best to have it. Oh, go ahead, Rick. Sorry. So I so two things. One is timing. What and then how? What's the impact of is COVID? They keep talking. The presentation seems to talk about in person, but I'm sure this would have to be done uh, surveys remotely and, and by video. Does that impact the product at all? And second is timing. Um, I think we need to get this started really soon so that we could roll this into our planning in next year particularly practically so we would have labor, we'd be able to start negotiations before and finish that before budget next year. So those are questions, I guess, but also if elcon has been reluctant to provide something, I, I think I would go ahead and, and go with this process but I would want to get some timing that, that when would they be able to start? When would they be able to finish? They led me to believe they could start this fairly, fairly quickly. Okay. What, what is the, um, the scope of services? So when you say strategic plan and citizen forum, um, how much face time are you going to get with their staff and facilitators and, um, is this Mike? Mike, you were involved with the last one, correct? Yes, it was. It was a good process. I think it was. The initial interviews were over a weekend. Matt was there too, and then uh, I don't know if they had a follow up visit. I think they did. Yes, they, they put their report together, but they broke everybody out into the little groups, and they had a good mix of people from uh, interest groups and and uh, stakeholders. 
it was they, they ran a very professional uh, very professional process and it came out with a pretty good product in the end it, it was something that we could have probably told them ourselves but we need that third party to confirm that the community and public are along uh, for the ride so group uh, this is police I just have a question would it be okay to um, solicit uh, questions to the community to get their feedback? Say we give them 10 points and they respond back to us so we have some kind of information from the community before we meet with uh, ESCI? That will be part of the ESCI process. That's what they okay, do. So they, they do it? They have, they have a questionnaire. Okay. Yeah. All and right. they will let us review the questions beforehand. Okay, thanks, Chief. Sure. Rick, this is John. Yes, John. I, I think somewhere in this process, we've been, we have been skirting the issue about a full-blown merger. Now we need to get information on that the board staff community members need to make a decision on that if that is the right direction and the direction the community planning everything about that if it is not we'll have to figure out maybe how we're going to restructure because we are a little bit dysfunctional right now so i think in the strategic planning we need to figure out how we're going to look moving forward Right. I yeah. Hey John, that's I, I, what I take the whole purpose of the thing for. Yeah, it, it, it's to ask the questions like that, especially with the, the different interest groups and come up with good recommendations and uh, go from there. But yeah, to me, I, I just want to keep going for. I just want to be sure we get that done in the process was all I was commenting for. Good. Yeah, their, their study on a merger, that's their $50,000 price tag. Um, I think in the last strategic plan, it was just both agencies should consider merging or what a merger would look like um, without any details. And I agree, John, that's, where, that's why we're at where we are. Um, well, I, I, don't, I don't see the 50,000 as a problem. Isla Valley has all the money they can put <laughs> well, it would be 50 50. I also wonder, uh, I guess Sullivan Cotter is involved with the hospital. Uh, what if we need the services of Sullivan Cotter as part of the process? Um, they provide a different service as kind of an adjunct to what um, we're, we're anticipating, what we're considering here. Um, so that would be an additional cost. That's is is that salary review things like that? Is that what you're talking about, Larry? Yeah. It, well, it's yeah. it's. I mean, if we if we have a strategic plan, we we might have to have that side of the equation answered as well. And those are all good good points. I think then it might it might be beneficial to have an ESCI representative talk to the board. Mm -hmm. and to get that feedback that would be a good idea yeah chief did you did you think then this could be done within how how long a time period i would think by the end of the summer okay even if we wait to talk to esi because um, i'm thinking if wait. we can't i don't know if we can wait and i wouldn't want to wait another month really to start a process well, we but, can, I, I can arrange a special meeting or if it's just uh, two board members who want to talk, we don't have to have a special meeting, but um, I think they'd, they'd be more than willing. This is what they do. So I, I think they'd be more than willing to, to meet with us and then we can find out what definitely what the, the timeline would be. I think they're going to be much quicker than LCOG. Yeah. Especially right now. Yes. Well, I'd be up for a special meeting um, 
just to hear more about their process and product. Come yeah, and, and, oh, and especially, oh, I'm sorry, Chief, go ahead. I, just, I was gonna propose that I'll contact the SCI and, and see what availability they have for a, a special meeting for both boards. And, and, and Chief, if they're talking about a cooperative efforts feasibility study, you know they're gonna wanna hit on community risk assessment. And my feeling is we're not gonna pay for that twice. So if they're looking at a cooperative efforts, then they need to take into consideration the community risk assessment and the standards for coverage there. It's not, it's, it's not like we're one agency looking at a standards of coverage plan. We're looking at potentially two coming to one. They should incorporate that into it. It's not a double dip. Uh, we can certainly ask them. Yeah, please. Yeah, we'll contact them tomorrow and see what, uh, what we can arrange. Okay, next uh, business item was to, um, so with the MIH program, as part of that budget, uh, there is a, a replacement vehicle. So right now our MIH uh, medic, uh, Wendy, she is using one of the Western Lane Ambulance District vehicles. Um, so we put in the budget, or Matt put in the budget for the MIH program to replace that vehicle. Um, we reached out to the local Ford dealer. He had a used uh, vehicle, which fits all the requirements. Um, again, it's completely covered by the budget, or by the uh, grant. Um, but it is um, an expenditure, so I wanted to get approval uh, by the Western Lane Ambulance District Board to make that purchase. Uh, we do have multiple quotes. It's, it's an excellent price. It's a Ford Escape, I believe, a white Ford Escape, Escape with about 25,000 miles on it, a sort of an SUV, and I think it would work great. How much is it? 15, 15 three. I think. Are you looking for a motion, Chief? Yes. I'll make a motion to approve the purchase of the Ford Escape for the MIH program. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. That was Mike, Director Webb. Okay, yes. first, second. Any discussion? Does that price include uh, putting the logos on the vehicle? It does not. Good question, Cindy, it does not. That's I don't know if we got a price yet, Matt, did we? Or do we get a price on the logos? I'm working on the uplifting to that vehicle at the same time that I'm working on your vehicle. So the anticipating, I haven't got any work artwork back on that vehicle. So I would anticipate probably at the high end, three to 5,000 for additional artwork to it. So MIH, given the appropriate recognition to Peace Health and our agency. And that would come that would come out of the grants as well. Correct. So we increase the amount that we're moving for to the include that amount. I'll amend my motion. Do we have a see I, 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 amend, I second with the amendment? Okay. And another since Cindy you brought that up, it's a good question. So Matt, does the three to five thousand include all alterations on top of the purchase price? Or yeah. there are other things that would need to be done. If I remember correctly, the capital budget that we did for it was thirty thousand. So we're looking at still a ten thousand saving with this vehicle. Perfect. All, all said and done. That's my goal. Twenty thousand is what I was looking at. Okay. And that's that's the motion, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's do a quick roll call vote, please. Okay, Director Webb. Yes. Director Russell. Yes. Director Farnsworth? Yes. Director Yesney? Yes. And Director Murphy? Yes. Thank you, everybody. So staff reports, um, start with the Chief's report. I'm gonna give the SCFR board an update on arbitration. Uh, we had our arbitration hearing on Monday and Tuesday, two very long days. Um, both sides will be submitting their final written arguments to the arbitrator on July by July 17th. 
And then the arbitrator said he would have his ruling uh, within two weeks back to us. Uh, I'm, I'm still confident in our position, but uh, I'm not willing to bet on the outcome uh, either way. Uh, for the Western Lane Board, uh, I've started looking into uh, what we need to do to renew the levy, the operating levy. Um, in the past, it appears that uh, the board has either gone every, it's a five-year levy, but they've gone out early just in case it would, it would fail, that they could run it again. So it's, ever, it's been every four to four and a half years. Um, uh, last one was in 2016, November 8th of, of 2016, passed 78%, uh, which is very good. Uh, the board worked, or the district worked with a professional um, group uh, that ran the, the levy campaign for them. It was Pros Prospect PDX, um, who has gone out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, they, no, they no longer are active. Uh, Liz Loomis has, we've worked with Liz Loomis before. I've worked with her uh, previous to here. Um, she does something similar. I've not talked to her yet, um, but if we want to have a professional uh, group run our campaign for us. Um, I will reach out to her and get a price. Um, none of them are cheap, but I think it's, it covers all your bases, which is, which is always a good thing. So I'll just be reaching out to her. I th we're thinking potentially maybe either next May or next November of 21 is when we'd be going um, back to the voters. To it, was well worth, it was well worth having the agency help. They, they did a lot for us. <laughs> yeah, they do all the, the pamphlets and, and getting the word out. And, 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 they, uh, and they were the ones that highly recommended that we go in May rather than November. Yeah. So I'll reach out to Liz Lewis and uh, and see and then bring prices back for everybody and schedule. For everybody. Hey, Chief, just just for knowledge, is it is there any restrictions on spending money on anything like that from a public district, or do we have to fund that out of something in particular? I don't believe so. Can we use we don't we can use tax dollars to to do that. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> So I want to uh, give an update on uh, Lexapol today, and uh, I know the Western Lane Board had just talked about that with their board assessment, but uh, Matt, Dean, and I have been meeting uh, once a week and going over uh, several policies, anywhere five to ten. Um, these are the Lexapol policies, brand new policies. Um, we want to make sure that they cover both districts, that they apply to us, that the wording is correct. Um, our intent then is to go through these as quickly as we can, make our corrections, and then bring in employees. And we can bring in board members at the same time just to get a, a more of a final reading on, on those policies. And then, of course, they'd have to come back to the boards for, for approval. And then after that, there'd be a routine uh, policy review. Um, what I've done in the past is every board meeting, we had four policies that had to be reviewed. And that, that put them on a three-year cycle. Um, there's a lot of policies, so to, to put them on a year cycle, you, you could be talking 15 to 20 policies each board meeting, which can be quite daunting, but uh, uh, that's up to the board how often they want to review those. But I agree, they, they should be on a, a review process and a timeline. So you'll, you'll be seeing more of that. And then with SVFR, uh, I'm starting to uh, look at getting Civil Service Commission back up and running. We, we had uh, approved, or you had approved, um, the hiring of those additional firefighters. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we have civil service up and running. It would have to be um, the, the, the job description, the hiring process would all have to be approved by the Civil Service Commission. Um, I think the earliest we would bring any of those firefighters on would be probably January 1, um, because it takes a long process to, to do it correctly. And again, we'll keep the board up yep. to date and, and uh, and how we want to use those firefighters and, and when the actual high pro hiring process would go forward. Chief, uh, this is Director okay. Police. I have a question. Are, sure. are we going to uh, open that up to laterals or is it just going to be entry level? Uh, it would be entry level positions, but we would certainly open them up to laterals. I think you have to open it up. Um, I don't know that you can do a, an internal. I'd have to, um, I'll double check that. 
Um, but we would give preference to our internal people, our internal candidates. We'd give okay. five to ten percent, depending on how long they've been been a member. Right. But it is Thank considered you. an entry level position. Firefighter engineer. Thank you. Firefighter what? Firefighter engineer, or what? What does that mean in terms of which level you're hiring at? That would be the entry level. That's the the bottom level that we hire at. So they, they would also be EMTs. It's just the official position is firefighter engineer. I see. Mm -hmm. And I've also been working with the uh, unions. These are sort of some side negotiations on, on moving to a, a 2448 or 4896 schedule. This is for SC4. Um, uh, Todd asked if I could do some of that uh, on the side. These are non-economic issues. Uh, it would be like uh, vacation accrual and, and sick leave accrual and, and they no longer um, get lunch off. They would have to, they'd be still be on duty at lunch, those things like that. So um, those are uh, ongoing. I uh, ran into a little snag with them today about that. They wanted to bring up some economic issues, which I said is not part of, of what uh, we're going to be discussing, um, but hope to have that resolved. Uh, within the next month or so, so that if we do go to 2448 or 4896 schedule on a permanent basis, uh, we'll have everything, the non-economic issues settled. Um, but uh, that's still ongoing. And that's what I have. Matt. Yeah. Okay, on page, as I just moved away from it, my uh, chief ops report on page 56 is the call breakdown. Um, call volumes uh, for Western Lanes pretty actually was increased compared to last year by 15, and annually we're ahead compared to last year as well. But again, I continue to see the trend. The breakdown is we have less transports, higher no patients and our transfers are higher as well. But um, what we're kind of anticipating the COVID to play, you know, in our call volumes really hasn't yet. But I can tell you right now in June is just started off like firecrackers. I and mean, we have been going and going and going, both districts have, which uh, tells me that summer is here because usually we don't get that until July. So um, yesterday alone, Western Lane Ambulance in a 24 hour period, we did nine transfers. No, actually, oh, 48, wow. hour, a 48 hour period. Sorry, we did nine transfers. Not the most we've ever done in a 48 hour period, but it was quite busy for them. Great. Any questions on call volumes? I have a, this is probably a Dina question, but, do, or, and Chief, do we, do we increase, Annually, do we increase our pricing on what we charge? No, that's as, as requested by the board or, or recommended by staff to the board, but the board would have to do that. Right. Uh, we, I, we do try and get uh, updates from system design on what other agencies are charging to make sure that we're not falling behind. And, and we are at the, the top end of charging. And then we raised yeah. it for, for um, out of district residents. Okay, I'm just curious because our collections, our collection rate looks like it's going up. So that uh, on the AR schedule and that, if, if we're not increasing prices, we must be getting paid a little bit better. So maybe we got a little bump in rate or something. I think we're doing more transfers. I think we're really seeing more transfers, which we get paid for. Okay. Still trying to figure out what, we're probably going to hit 2 million this year or get darn close to it. It's going to be very close. I, I didn't amazing. think we were, but but June has has been been great. Well, May was May was revenue was quite good. So I was just trying to figure out if we increase prices, but it doesn't. If we don't, that makes sense. The collection rate would go up too. How often do we right. raise prices? I'm, I'm sorry. Say again. How often do we raise prices? It's it's up to the board. Okay. I mean. Uh, as a board, do we want to see a recommendation annually? Uh, I mean, it seemed to me that, yeah. I mean, the raising of the rates really only helps us with private pay and self pay. Right. So, right. you know, it would seem to me like for that portion of our business, we should be pretty aggressive uh, because it's not going to change what Medicare and Medicaid pay. 
Right. So right. I, I don't mind being at the top of the spectrum in that regard. You know. And you, when we approved it last year, we actually went up by I think eight or nine hundred dollars for private pay added district. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and and like Chief Schick had said, we're pretty much in line with districts throughout the state of Oregon with what we charge. Mm -hmm. And also the critical care component is a different add-on where we give additional revenues because of the higher level of care. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad idea though to have maybe an annual report from system design. They'll, they'll show us what everybody else is charging. They won't give us names all the time, but they'll show us who's charging and how much. And that, that's not bad to have an annual report on that. Yeah. So do you want to make that a request, Larry? I think that's a good yeah, idea. I'd like to see that. Uh, what's the best yeah, we'll year to see that? Is it right at the beginning of the fiscal year that we should see that? Probably going into budget time, it's hard to do it. OK, so approaching budget time, and we anticipate doing that in the fall. So maybe we should be Budgets are springtime. I understand, but if we're looking at it, we should we should maybe do it December thirty first. Maybe we should do it October thirtieth. Something. Our recommendation. Sorry, uh, recommendation would be the first of the year. First of the year. Yeah, your mid then your mid fiscal year, and if anybody has other made changes for other districts, we mm -hmm. can judge that as well. Okay, so let's make that our practice if we can. Okay, I can make it happen absolutely. Good, good idea. A uh, question to the fire chief. Uh, chief, with the 4th of July coming up and we're starting to see the influx of uh, visitors and the fireworks <laughs> stands are popping up. I saw do that. We, <laughs> do we have any kind of a cost recovery program for people that negligently start a fire with fireworks? We do not. Okay. Is there anything in the Oregon state uh, state law that allows us to collect for negligence? I have never heard of that being done, Jim, but I can certainly ask. Could you please? Because I know the previous state I came from, we did have cost recovery. If, if a person starts a fire knowing that it was wrong to do so, they were on the hook to pay for all the suppression costs. There was the case up in the gorge two years ago right. where the kids started a fire with fireworks and it actually went to civil where the parents had to pay like $4 million. Okay. Of course, yeah. I don't, don't think that's gonna happen, but. No, no, I don't either, Matt. <laughs> but, but if you get a judgment against somebody and then two weeks later they hit the lottery, that money goes back to the community yeah. that had to pay for the cost. Yeah, we'll okay. find we'll find out, Jim. All right, thank you. Chief? Yes. Chief? Yes. This is Alan Burns. There is something going on because I remember several years ago a person in a similar situation had a brush fire that got had a fire got out of control and he had to pay about $24,000 for the equipment putting it out. He paid that to the fire district? Yes. Oh, interesting. I think they, you'd have to show that they were negligent. Um, well, he was, he, he was, and, and he freely admitted it. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, we can certainly uh, look into that. Especially if we're calling in the aircraft, because that's going to cost a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> Be my first choice. Well, he right didn't now. have to do that, but uh, he did have uh, it, homeowners insurance did cover some stuff. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, um, Alan. So continue. No on problem, with, sir. Continue with the call volume. Uh, again, a three-year call volume comparison with COVID. I put that data up there. Again, it's just showing little drops in trends of our transport and transfers and our no patients being increased significantly because of what it's, that COVID environment has caused us to do in operations. 
um, the mobile integrated healthcare, uh, the call volumes are there. We've maintained pretty high still. Big news, of course, is we were awarded the two year, $250,000 grant, and we've actually done some public uh, with Peace Health. You know, it was Peace Health Riverbend. We did some marketing with it at their cost and broadcasted it out. I wasn't able to get any copies for our correspondence, but uh, I know a, an article went out in the paper that I believe was the Register Guard. I haven't even seen it. I was going to ask Ann about it. That's the one that deals with all their PR at Riverbend. Um, continues to do good. Uh, palliative care is definitely becoming a mainstay in the program. Um, training report, both districts again continue to train under the new COVID environment. Rob has con uh, completed our annual proficiency with Westland Ambulance District. And with any proficiency, the goal is not to find the failures, but by doing the proficiency, you can find areas that where you need to improve. And it was well identified, we need to put some more training into pediatric and protocols. But I was very pleased with the overall numbers and the assessment from Rob did. Uh, our protocols tests were in the 90s for the average. And then the assessments, Rob said that everybody did really, really, really well across the board. So we continue just to lead by example and put the training in to get where we need to go. Uh, on the fire side, we've opened up this month in June as our first kind of more interactions. Now that phase two is open for COVID, so we're doing more company level, multi-company level trainings out and about. And I, we were looking into July, completely opening it up, but as COVID numbers are spiking, we're keeping an eye on that and seeing how it's going, how we're gonna have to adjust or we're gonna have to adjust as we're moving forward. Um, we, the vehicle and fleet maintenance, Rescue 10, unfortunately, had a transmission issue on a call. It's been fixed and replaced and back in service. Ran a call with it today, did well. Uh, Medic 619 required uh, the, the employee seating area, which we called the patients, um, to be adjusted because the gurney, we were told that we bought the gurney that would fit okay, but it's not so much. It cost us $900 to fix the seats, and now there's adequate room for our staff not feeling like they're a, pre a pretzel in the back taking care of their patients. Um, and then, uh, like you said, that asking about that valley was a sensor for Medic 619. Mercedes and Dodges have a tendency of having a sensor go off, and unfortunately, they're over easily over two thousand dollars to fix it. Fireside uh, water tender 608 had to have a pump repaired, but it's back in service, operating good. Other than that, it was just normal maintenance for both districts. Um, got word of last week, Chief's vehicle was in the process. We're expecting two to four weeks for it to be shipped out to us. Already started working on the uplifting of the vehicle, so we're hoping within a month to maybe six weeks we'll have his vehicle complete and he'll be happy. Fire prevention staff report, still doing great work while he's on shift work. They installed many smoke detectors, 62 over the last month, and his report is in the package. Uh, community support team and the mobile crisis support team. Again, Lori is doing a great job developing it and growing it. Uh, I think over the last two weeks to a month, we've brought on anywhere between eight to 10 part-time additional employees into that program to help her with it. So it's going good. And definitely with this environment, it used to be once a week that they're going on our calls. It almost seems like at least once a day, if not multiple times a day, that they're going out and assisting law enforcement and helping with the mental health patients out in our community. Recruit and retention. Unfortunately, I sent out seven letters to volunteers that have not been active for the last year plus and dismissed them. And as I'm trying to get this district to a better foundation to grow on, um, I felt that it was necessary to remove people that have not been participating to the district in the last seven years. So the recruiting retention report, you'll see the numbers actually being more reflecting to what we have in the district as response. Um, that pretty much is the report. Happy to answer any questions. Hey, Matt. Any else? Oh, geez. Uh, yeah. Just real <laughs> Real quick, any question or any opportunity to grow Mapleton a little bit? I know ambulance is not getting any support from the QRT or, or very infrequent. So it's something I think that if there's a way that we can help foster that, that would be a good thing to do. 
I agree. We'll continue to work on that relationship. And that's that's actually on, on my list of things that I think should be discussed at strategic planning is what we want to do up the river. Chief House, uh, Jim Polisi here. First of all and foremost, uh, please extend a uh, uh, an attaboy to uh, training officer Chance. I, I really like that report. He's clear, yeah. concise, and he knows what he's going for. And I, uh, I, I totally support that. The uh, not just the EMS portion for Western Lane, but for the fire district. Um, the other thing too that I was reading about was the uh, uh, Blair Campbell and Andrew Jeffords and the registered EMT intermediates. I think that's great. I, I, I think seeing that kind of involvement from the fire side is um, what we're looking at. We're looking at a true all risk agency. And, and my question is, has Chief House, uh, or Chief Chance, excuse me, has he been, um, anybody from the high school district made contact with him about a uh, um, uh, career development program for seniors? That's something that both, and as I'm working through some of the problems and correcting some of the issues, is the foundation is what I'm trying to get to with the district, but that is absolutely something I want to get involved with at the high school for, there used Good. to be what's called an explorer program, but that yes. ran into some issues with the, what would be the legal issues that came from Boy Scouts. And I don't know how that would play out now because I don't think they sponsor it, but there are other avenues and venues that you can actually recruit these people. Like uh, Danielle Holmes, one of our great paramedics, she would actually go into the health op class, health occupation class and teach CPR, give them in which they would come into our agency to do their ride time too, part of it. And right. a couple of them actually made careers in going that direction to be paramedic or firefighters. Well, I, I'm all for um, cultivating our own. Yeah, and, if you, and if you get to them at a young age, like I was got to at a very young age, at the age of 14, and I made a career in the fire service, and I loved it. And, and, and I truly believe that we can reach that younger age bracket and bring them up. And so, I mean, anything we can do as a district or both districts to help, you know, with the career development and the succession planning is in our best benefit and the benefit to the taxpayer. <clears throat> so nice yep. work, Matt. Nice I, work. I would add in on that. Is there, I think it's a great idea. And I wondered about LCC because don't they do EMT and paramedic training? Yeah. So we are already affiliated with the LCC. In fact, Tom, uh, Doug, Derek are all instructors and not just instructors, like Derek is the lead paramedic instructor for the whole program. Tom is one of the valuable instructors that, and Doug has just recently taken on his part-time what he's instructing the upcoming EMT advanced intermediate class. So they're heavily relying on our skill set at the college, but also we weren't able to do an EMT class this year, but remember the last two years, we were able to do EMT classes for cultivating and you know getting into session within our own district. And the plan is, is that that QRT money that we budgeted for 16.5 is still there for hopefully next year, we can get the EMT class back here and, the, and have more response from the areas. Okay, and that EMT class can be, can it totally be taught here? We did both years. Perfect, thanks. You're welcome. Nice. Any more questions for Matt? Good job, Matt. Dina, office manager. Okay, we are pretty much concluding our workstation replacement project with the IT, the new IT company. Uh, they've come in, we've we purchased 11 new computers and each station has been replaced. And we are also, uh, the only thing we really have left to do on that project is to restage some of the repurposed like the 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 um, the used 
computers out to the outer station, so that hasn't taken place yet. But they've all been wiped, and um, I, you know, I'm really impressed with our new IT company. She, uh, she's been here every week to do a few computers at a time. When she has them, like in a downloading process, she goes around and finds other things to do to, to help us, and um, she's, I'm just really pleased with them. We have one more project coming up, which kind of, uh, it, it really helps us clean, finish cleaning things up from the past. And that is uh, to redo the cabling upstairs and in the workstation cubicles. Uh, upstairs, as you recall, we replaced some of the Wi-Fi APs and one of them is still not at full capacity because we did not have a managed switch up there. So we are, the project is going to cost around 4750 and this is on the SVFR side, so Western Lane will not be paying for this, but this is, this is to improve the, the Wi-Fi upstairs in the training room and to clean up the, uh, the miscellaneous switches and wiring that are out in the cubicle area. Out of the, the six computer stations, there's three switches on the floor that have wires running all over and it's, it's just been a mess. So this is going to clean that up, get it all neat and tidy. And, and um, the other thing, the other part of that project is to get another switch. While they're doing all this at the same time, it's cost effective to get another switch to uh, handle any future data connections. Because once these, um, this gets fixed, the, the current switch is completely saturated and maxed out. So I think this project will be well worth it and, uh, and we'll be in, sitting in pretty good shape for our IT needs. I already talked a little bit about LifeMed uh, and the admin staff, um, but I just wanted to mention that with all the Zoom meetings lately, uh, there are still some minutes that are outstanding. You know, we had the, the Wealthia board had the June 8th meeting and then there were the two budget hearings, the one for SVFR and was one for Western Lane. Those minutes will be done and ready for your approval at the July 23rd meeting. And lastly, I'm just going through the, the budgets now that they're adopted. I'm polishing them up a little bit to get them into uh, publish format. We're not gonna have the large 40 page document that you've seen in the past. It's probably only gonna be maybe 10 pages. Um, there will be a cover page and, you know, in, in just a few, uh, you know, like chief's budget message and all of the, all the spreadsheets, but we're kind of scaling down to a, a briefer, more to the point budget document. And hopefully that will be uh, available for you here in the next couple of weeks. That's all I have. Thanks, Dina. Any questions for Dina? Dina, I Question about the life med renewal. Um, who did who did the uh, paperwork that went with that? Who did the the form the renewal forms? The, the information letter that came with it, because we used to have uh, listed what the ASA was with it, and also where some of the money went. Because I have a lot of community members to me. If we're no longer using the money for education, such as classes and such. So I was just wondering if we need to revisit those papers that are sent with the life med for next year. Yeah, I would be happy to. I'm, I'm not real familiar with, with what went out in the past. This is the first year that uh, we're actually doing it. We, in the past, we've had Shannon Sheets oversee the program and, and we're, we're doing it on our own this year. So I'll get together with Chief House and maybe t uh, reach out to you again to find out exactly what you're referring to to make sure that we okay. can include that. Okay, thank you. Maybe, um, I wonder if it's time, maybe we can do it with the review of our charges for services, but I wonder if we ought to review maybe a slight price increase on LifeMed as well. I think I need to look at that. We are right at the top of, of what other agencies are, are charging. It doesn't mean we can't raise it. Um, and this year certainly looked good. I think the returns have been fantastic. Um, so I think our revenue is going to be very good this year, but we can certainly address. 
Okay. Crazy. Yeah, I didn't know where we were in the market, and I, I don't think we've increased prices for some time. I think it was eight years. Eight Sorry. years at 65? Yeah, it's hard to believe we're at the top. With, you know. We did a review last year, and, and yeah, we're, we're pretty much at the top. Okay. We should be able to look at the financial analysis that Dina prepares so that we can see if we're expect a loss when you consider the write off. Yeah, should, should get at least a little margin out of that or break even. Right. So, yeah, we, we make money on the write offs. It's the extra stuff, the, the QRT equipment and the advertising. That's mm -hmm. where overall the, the program in the past has taken a little loss. Uh, this year it's looking very good so we may we may show a profit it's the car seats and everything else yeah yeah hey, uh, folks um this is jim polisi i just got a question on life med i mean i'm a member i love it i paid for it this year but is there any chance we can add like a life uh, uh life med membership level two where it includes life flight so if somebody we, we wanted, actually, Jim, what's that? It's a different program. They're, they I, have their own programs. I know, but would they be willing to work with us and have a, I don't know. I don't and, want to call we, it we've a talked, premium. Yeah, we've talked about that. And, and Matt, you can go ahead and address it. They, they have their own subscription program. So they're not going to cut us a break to combine them. All right. Never and, mind. And really, Dr. And Director Polisi, the problem that we ran, to, ran into with the aeromedical industry was you have A and B, but they don't play well with each other. And then so uh -huh. we're over here trying to figure out which one to call, and that's not best patient care. So when we need a helicopter, I don't want my guys thinking or listening to the staff or the patient saying, well, I have Life Med or I have REACH and making decisions based on that. Decisions based on availability when we can get them, because these are time sensitive issues. Oh, wow. Okay, well, that's really good to know. So if if somebody joins up with LifeLight and LifeLight's out of service. Correct. Then REACH comes in and REACH the different service. Correct. They don't talk to one another. Is that what you're saying? Right, like where LifeMed wow. reciprocates with almost 100 different agencies in the state. Yeah. That they do not do the same in the aeromedical world. Oh boy. And there was a, there's another company that's selling a life med type product and they typically solicit Thanks, Matt. community. <laughs> and they, they try to have lunches and dinners at Chen to give people a free meal and sign them up. And I think they were foiled from having their free meals because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. Fine by me. <laughs> Wow, you know, you would think that they would talk to one another for, you know, the benefit of humanity, but I guess yeah, I'm, oh I'm naive. <laughs> What's that, Cindy? I'm sorry. The almighty dollar. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Germany, Germany. <laughs> Boy, I could not hear what that was. Three of those words, John. Yeah. What was you that, John? Get back on track. Yeah. Got any, it. Any, All any, right. more question, any more questions for Dina? Or? No. Okay, the only correspondence we had, this was actually an email from Mike Cabin. He's the IAFF A51 president. And this was at the, it was an email he sent uh, before the last board meeting. We didn't know that was correspondence to the board. Um, so we agreed to, to put it into the board packet this, this month. So it is there. Uh, now we'd like to do director comments. So starting with Westerland Ambulance District. I just want to reiterate that uh, I, I know when it came on the board, we talked about rotating leadership positions, and, and uh, I, my thought was two years was a was a good good run for being a president. I don't want to start smelling like an old shoe, so uh, 
So I think it's time to rotate in. Um, it's good to have another tomorrow leadership, I think, on the board. And I uh, want to thank the uh, – want to tell you that the staff, you know, if you ever get in that role, the staff's been great. Um, Chief and the staff have always been responsive to anything I needed. Um, thank the board for their patience. Um, I think it's time to rotate off. So just be thinking about who you would like to nominate and elect uh, at our July meeting. Any other Western Lane Ambulance Directors? Any SAFR Board of Directors? Comments? Uh, Jim Policy to the Go Chief. Ahead. Hey, um, Chief, there's, uh, I, I know we've given approval for you to go out for some new apparatus. Yes. Um, there's a lot of really good deals popping up from many manufacturers for yeah. type sixes, type threes, tactical water tenders. They're offering some pretty good bargains for a lot of the demo units, you know, that are out there. And even some of the manufacturers that are doing refurbishing. So if, if you think of any of the rigs that need to go in for refurbishment, where we just take, you know, the build up off and put it on a new chassis or you buy a new water tender, I think now's a good time to be looking at that. I agree. And especially with, you know, single source, or you can jump on someone else's budget. I agree. Okay. That's all I had. Thanks. Thanks, Director Polisi. Ms. V. Farr, Directors. Okay. Uh, future business, all meetings will be conducted via Zoom until further notice. Our next regular joint board meeting is Thursday, July 23rd at 6 p.m. Uh, there is an executive session tonight. Um, there will be no action from that meeting. Dina, do you want to read that? Following adjournment, the SBFR and Western Lane Ambulance Board of Directors will meet in executive session per ORS 192-660-2D to conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations. Representatives of the news media and the audience members are asked to leave the Zoom. No final decisions will be made during executive session and the board does not plan to return to open session tonight. Thank you, Dina. So I'm looking for a motion for adjournment. So, we'll, um, so that was Rick Gessie, and I'll give Cindy Russell the second. Thank you. Uh, meetings adjourned. And so we will take about five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Yeah, that's fine. A couple minutes. It'll be seven, seven thirty-seven by my Perfect. clock. Okay. I want to say how incredibly Matt looks. What's he look like? He looks so happy. <laughs> okay, so we got one, one two, three. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Oh, did I drop a board member? I hope not. I dropped that galaxy. Was that a board member, Dina? Uh, the only board member that was not in attendance was uh, Ron Green. I don't know who galaxy was. I'm only showing. I count 10. I count nine. Okay. I'm only counting eight. Where's, uh, where's Alan Burns? Was he, get, no, he wasn't Galaxy. Did no, he leave? But he's not yeah. on Zoom anymore. He left. Okay. Right.